May we have your attention, please? You're listening to Tales from the Tannoy with Eleanor Hamilton. So many voices that we hear in our everyday lives, on your smart speaker or sat-nav or announcing a train, are actually real people. But we very rarely get to know their name, even though we shout at them quite a lot. My voice is heard on the London Underground. The next train to arrive alongside Platform 2 will be an Edgware Road service. And on Birmingham's trams. And usually, wherever you hear my voice, my husband, Phil Sayer's voice, isn't far away. Mind the gap. However, in 2016, Phil died. So it's strange to think that the male and female voice on the station platform are a married couple, with one dead and one alive. But I'd rather be working together like that than to not have his voice at all. You can hear more about us in episode one, but everyone has a story, even those voices that we know and don't always love. So I'm going to try and speak to them all. There is one voiceover in the UK that probably everyone knows. And unusually, we also know his name. It's this guy. Tonight, it's the X Factor final. It's time to face the music. Peter Dixon, you're probably most famous for The X Factor, but you've done countless things that we might not know about, including the fact that a few years ago now, you were actually the youngest TV newsreader. (laughs) Yes, I was the youngest newsreader. I think I still hold the record as being the youngest newsreader on the BBC, not on TV. Going back to 1975 here, a long time ago, Hmm. when I was um, just leaving school, just about to leave school, I was still at school, in fact, when uh, I was scouting around to to work out which university I was going to go to. And um, there were several options, one of which was Queen's University in Belfast, which is my hometown. And Hmm. um, I... um, I went in the summer before I was about to leave school to the university just to sort of see what the Freshers' Week looked like. And and I spoke to a few people, including a guy who was running the uh, University Film Society. And I was quite interested in film and photography at that time. Hmm. It turned out this guy wasn't a student. He was a cameraman at the BBC Hmm. in Northern Ireland. And uh, he was a television cameraman. And um, he had made this documentary off his own bat and and he asked me if I would like to narrate it and I said yes and I think I must have done a reasonably good job because he said to me several months later oh they're looking for somebody to uh, do part-time news reading duties and announcing duties hmm. uh, on radio um, in Belfast would you be interested in applying and I said well I hadn't thought of it but yes why not so I did apply and um, went in to see the head of the presentation department got the job eventually I was 17 years old and uh, I was doing part-time news reading reading and announcing work on the BBC and being paid literally pence for it. <laughs> but I didn't, ca- I didn't no, care, care because did uh, because I'd got my foot in the door and that was all that counted and that's all that mattered to me that I was... Yeah. Uh, I was and, and then all the way through my university degree, four years, I was, um, you know, after lectures, I'd rush down to the BBC to Broadcasting House and I'd start my shift and I'd do really? work uh, uh, on radio and on television eventually uh, progressed over to TV news where I was a co-anchor on the evening news program that's incredible I you- mean it, it really is I, when you think back of it the brazenness of it I was barely out of short trousers you know mm-hmm. I just thought oh my goodness me what a, you know thinking back I must have been mad but that's that's the arrogance of youth isn't it I think I mean, it is think- I like to encourage my kids to have that arrogance. They don't necessarily. They have arrogance with me when um, when I'm asking them to do things like put their pants away or whatever. But um, <laughs> you know, yes, it'd be nice to think that they would achieve slightly more in a day. But you know, <laughs> it doesn't matter because um, you don't sound like you're from Belfast. Have you always had a very neutral accent? No, I, I had a, a defined Northern Irish accent. It wasn't a very strong one. Um, hmm. My parents, neither of them, had a terribly strong uh, Northern Irish accent. But I can certainly go back there if I need to. You know, right. I can go back to very, very um, educated Northern Ireland where it, uh, people there would talk like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, Or I can go as broad as you like in Belfast and all I got there. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I mean, it, it's, I can switch it on and off. But uh, And when I do go back to Northern Ireland, which I do probably be about twice a year now mm-hmm. because I've still got family there, um, we, um, you know, I fall back into my old ways again. Of course. So um, I think as voice actors, actually, it's quite an interesting question this because when I go to America, or in fact, any country I go to, I always like to, I don't know why, but I like to try and blend in. I hate Mm. standing out in a crowd. And so... um when I'm in America, I kind of adopt this kind of ridiculous mid-Atlantic accent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then when I'm in Ireland, I would adopt an Irish accent, uh, depending on which side of the border I was on. You know, if I was in Southern Ireland, I would be, be, be a little bit more like that. You know, like, great, that's great. Grand, good to see you again. Um, 
<laughs> but I think that we're uh, all chameleons, aren't we, in this industry? And, and I always say that I will put on whichever accent the person paying the bill wants me to put on. Um, yes. You know, and if I'm with my friends um, in the north of England, I'll definitely be more Bath than Bath. Um, and it just depends on who you're speaking to. And I think that it's just True. the skill of the voice actor is to just fit in um, wherever you are. It's also, I think, something to do with the fact that we're always practicing and listening. And the better listener you can be, the more you listen, the more you learn about accents and about mm. how people behave and talk. So when I'm away from home, wherever I may be, I'm always listening to how people speak and their speech patterns and their accents. And and perhaps that's why I do it. I don't know. I think it's just like I'm practicing constantly. I used to find that when I was a teenager, I was brilliant at accents because I was always looking at, especially Australian and American things, because of course those were the, the programmes that we watched then. Um, and now, because I don't tend to watch much television and I rarely get out of Bolton, um, I don't think I'm as good um, a mimic as I used to be. I think you've got to keep practicing those oh, things absolutely. and speaking to people from various walks of life. You've got to keep exercising those muscles of, uh, you know, articulation and, and listening and practicing and recording yourself as well and listening mm. back with an honest ear and thinking, D does this sound like a genuine speaker from this part of the world or not? Because mm. yeah. there's nothing worse, is there, than hearing, for example, you know, a, a play set in Bolton mm. and, f and with actors in it who don't come from Bolton uh, attempting yeah. to do, do a Bolton accent, you know. And, uh, <laughs> I think you do a better Bolton accent than I do. <laughs> <laughs> You're been joking, here about 15 aren't you? You're years. Joking. You're joking. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a <laughs> that really grates on the ear when you hear it. You it know, does. when you're a native speaker and you hear uh, hear an Irish or a, a, a Bolton accent, which mm. is badly done. You know, there's no excuse for it. Yeah. So w with your accent, did it just sort of gradually um, move to, to being much more RP? Um, is, was that well, partly because of work or? Partly to do with work. That My accent changed, I think, when I first came to London, uh, would have been 1982, because I by then I'd been working at the BBC in Belfast for a number of years. And mm. uh, I answered an advert in the BBC internal magazine, which was uh, for a Radio 2 announcer post at Broadcasting House in London. So I applied for this job and was invited to interview along with a whole load of other people. And I was given, uh, much to my astonishment, a six-month contract to go and get the BBC in, in London on Radio 2, which was a dream job. Oh, wow. And um, for the next 10 years, I was on uh, yearly contracts. Right. And they just kept extending the contract mm. uh, for 10 years. And again, at the end of those 10 years, though I'd had the most brilliant time and learned so much and met some of the most amazing people. Mm. I was at the point where I was kind of repeating myself again, you know, not mm. learning anything new. And I thought that at this time, there was the juicy prospect of becoming a freelance voiceover artist, you know, working in commercials, which yeah. I couldn't do because I was a BBC newsreader. They always said there was a conflict of interest. They wouldn't allow of that. Yeah. And so I was uh, being asked to do commercials and having to turn them down. And then, uh, of course, working on shifts, you can't always say when you're going to be around to do a gig. So mm. I got to the point after 10 years of contract work with the BBC that I thought, well, now's the time. If I don't do it now, I'll yeah. never do it. So I jumped ship, basically, and then went totally freelance as a voiceover artist right. and started picking up TV work and uh, commercials, uh, corporate, did a lot of corporate work and a lot of promos. And no two days were the same, which I think suits me because I get bored easily. Yeah. And so I was doing different things. This was pre-internet days almost. Mm. So I joined this very happy band of uh, transient voice artists who used to traipse around the country on a daily basis in their cars. Sometimes I would drive from my home in the south of England up to, you know, Birmingham and Newcastle or mm. down to the southwest of England or over to Essex. And... Um, You'd walk into a radio station, be greeted by a producer with a cup of coffee and a sheaf of scripts. Yeah. You'd go into the studio and you would read literally 15 or 20 commercials in that session I believe with different so. voices. And that was, for me, I think one of the best training grounds I think you could ask for as a voice artist to, to have that variety of script thrown at you in a live mm -hmm. situation and be able to do accents, characters, straight reads, fast reads, speed reads, tags, every single element of a commercial that you could ever think of. I covered in those 10 years as I drove around the country in my trusty Audi Quattro. <laughs> <laughs> and I bet that you had to, they had to make it worth your while to turn up, but also had to get as much value for money out of you as they could while you were there. So. Well, that's Right. The more and, scripts they could throw at you, the better, I imagine. 
it was f- such a fun time. You know, it was just so funny. Because you were working with one-on-one with a producer, the producer would sit on the other side of the desk. The commercials were mixed more or less live as we did them right. you know, in those days. This is extraordinary for people to think about now. Mm-hmm. There was no post-production as such, very little. There wasn't the time or the money. They'd line up a piece of line up a record with the music they were going to use, you know, hmm. a piece of KPM library music. And then they'd line up another uh, record with a sound effect on it, perhaps, or they'd have a cart machine. God, mm. cart machines. And they'd have a cart machine with a, with a, with a sound effect on it. Uh, we'd both have our respective scripts in front of us, and I'd start reading, and the music would come on, and then the sound effects would appear in the right places. Mm. And uh, we'd rehearse it once and then record it, and then that was it, done. The yeah. commercial was made. But we had such fun. We, because you're working in the same room as somebody else, and but particularly a lot of these scripts weren't very well written, or maybe you come across a double entendre or something like mm. that. So you just laugh uh, endlessly. And, and once you get into that laughing phase, you know, you just can't get out of it. You're just giggling and corpsing all over the place. It used to take forever, you know. So you could be in there three or four hours sometimes, maybe an hour, an hour to three hours perhaps. It would, mm. would have been the maximum time. But... Um, it was uh, such fun, and uh, you know, and you'd drive home on the motorways. You know, you'd get into a traffic jam, and you'd look left and right. You'd see these guys, tra- salesmen or yeah. people that worked in offices. And you think, God, what must it be like to have a proper job? I know. <laughs> I still think this now. <laughs> Although I and think, I'm so glad I don't. No, I know, and I think that we do have to be kind of very grateful, especially at the moment. I feel very grateful at the moment that um, my life during coronavirus and lockdown hasn't really changed that much, apart from how many people around asking me for food um, there's just no kind of difference in my working day really um, and and I remember kind of thinking we're not actually essential if all the voiceovers in the land stopped working the world would still keep turning but how wonderful to be able to do a job that is fun you well say- you say unessential I mean I, I, I would take a argument with you on that one okay because uh, I think we are pretty essential you try and turn down the radio uh, during during to turn your radio off never listen to radio again mm. uh, or never listen to TV or never go to a railway station or an airport and it, and, and, and turn all the tannoys off you mm. know the world would be a, a much worse place without voiceover and I think I genuinely believe that we add such value to life. So, you know, we do identify with voices and we do we do find comfort in them. Um, you said something earlier that really interested me. It's sort of slightly going off topic now, but um, you said that you hate standing out in a crowd, um, which I think is really interesting because of the work that you do. Yes. Um, because you get to be creative, but nobody necessarily has to see you, <laughs> which must be yes. amazing. I've always said this, uh, that... Um, I have, I've never really been able to understand anyone who says to me, I, re- I want to be rich and famous. Mm. I would always say, could I just try the rich bit first and see how I get on with that? <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I think, uh, no, fame is something I think, you know, it ultimately destroys people. And mm. uh, I've always tried to avoid it. And one of the things I really, really love about being a voice actor and working on very high profile shows with lots of uh, very famous people that, um, you know, when I walk out of the studio uh, into the street, nobody bothers me, which yes. is, um, is to me, that's priceless. Mm. Because I've been around famous people a lot and um, I've seen how the public reacts to them being in their presence. Mm. And, you know, there's the scourge of the autographs at one point. I remember going out, going out to dinner with Bruce Forsyth many years ago and we sat down at dinner and um, this chap walked over to the table with an autograph book in his hand and he said uh, we we were just about to start eating our first course and he said to Bruce would you mind um, signing my autograph and having a chat with me and Bruce said well I'm just about to eat would you mind waiting Mm. and um, the chap said I'm terribly sorry yes of course and Bruce took the first mouthful of his starter. <laughs> the guy stood there at the table with his hands by his side watching us. <laughs> so, uh, no, it was. It was very funny. So we had to, he eventually had to sign the autograph to get rid of the guy. Yeah, of course. But, you know, nowadays it's the scourge of the selfie. and I the was self, just going to say. And, and, the, and the worse than that, there's the video, you know, and then there's the um, say this into my phone. Yeah. So tell me... Um, how, because you have become a name, but um, how did that voiceover style come about? Because I remember it being first on E4, I think, uh, where suddenly in the early noughties, everybody was going, E4! Um, and it was phenomenal and, and such an amazing change from everything that we were used to having on the television. 
Well, uh, yeah, there's a, there's, a, there's a history to it. Of mm. course, there is to everything. And I think we all stand on the shoulders of giants in our work. You know, we, mm. you know, nothing exists in isolation. We all have to take our inspiration, you know, whether you're a voice artist, an actor or a musician mm. or a painter even, you know, uh, you know, the history of art is interesting from that respect as well, that we, we all stand on the shoulders of giants and learn from each other. So it goes way back to when I was on Steve, when I worked for the BBC, I was on Steve Wright's show on Radio 1. I was yeah. creating telephone characters. One of the characters was a character called Voiceover Man, right. who, was, uh, who spoke in that kind of very um, 1980s kind of... <laughs> commercial delivery. Yes, that's right, Eleanor. <laughs> and, um, you know, it was very, very exaggerated prosody and very stylized uh, mm. in, that, in that awful kind of uh, voiceover -y kind of way. Yeah. Um, and so that's, that was the voiceover man character. And then I left Radio 1 and that character disappeared off the, mm. off the airwaves. And uh, then I was uh, invited to um, audition for, as you rightly mentioned, E4. Mm. Uh, who uh, for their promo department and uh the story was that uh, when, I, when I got there, that uh, Patrick Allen, who had been the voice of E4, had mm. fallen ill. And we didn't at the time know how ill he was. And I'd worked with Patrick many times mm. uh, on uh, the Eurosport channel back in the day. So Patrick wasn't able to continue, but they wanted to find somebody who could not imitate him as such, but to create a, a, another sound in the same vein, mm. if you like. I uh, auditioned and... Uh, then about two days later, they called my agent and said, "Yes, we'd like Peter to do the uh, to take over from Patrick," mm -hmm. but they said we need to speak to Patrick first. Okay. And I spoke to Patrick as well, and um, he gave his blessing for it because yeah. I wasn't entirely comfortable with what was about to happen. So we no. wanted just to make sure that he was, and uh, he was very gracious and said, "Yes, that's that's great that you can keep it, you know, keep it going." And um, so we did, and mm -hmm. you know, it, I think. You know, that was one of the most fun jobs I ever did. Yeah. Actually, it was not only just creating the sound for the, for the channel and that sort of um, pompous, avuncular style, yeah. uh, outraged from Tunbridge Wells' voice. Mm. And, um, and, and at the same time, they were giving me the most outrageously risque scripts to read. Yeah. Oh, it worked fantastically well. Uh, I mean, it was just <laughs> yeah. amazing. It was groundbreaking, really, because I suppose young people who were listening to this would not expect to have that kind of voice. But the fact that it was that kind of voice, the out outrage of Tunbridge Wells, worked so brilliantly because you were one of them, but not... You know, yes, <laughs> it was fantastic. Um, we also um, created. I'm also very proud of them. Little um, movies, little vignettes, little interstitial elements for the channel where I was in vision on various things. Oh right! Uh, and in one of them, I played both the Queen and Prince Philip uh, in the same <laughs> scene. <laughs> Took all day, but uh, it's one of the reasons I prefer working in sound because, as I said, that was a you know it was a, a one minute uh, yeah. film that took all day to make. Now, I've uh, done a small amount of television and, and it does, yeah. it takes all day just to do one little thing and I, and yeah. I, I haven't got patience for it really. <laughs> no, <never. laughs> but it's interesting what you were saying about taking over somebody else's um, job because I had that quite a lot when Phil died. Obviously, a lot of his work had to go to other people and it is hard. It's really hard to hear the person that you love being replaced. But I never minded it so much when it was someone he'd either already passed the work to or somebody that he admired. Um, it was only ever difficult, really, when I didn't think they were as good as him. Um, but life does move on. And you took that role and you made it your own. Yeah, um, yeah. And it led to other things. It led to the X Factor because the X Factor delivery is very similar to the E4. That kind of it almost became. Well, interestingly, your style. it wasn't at first because I think if you listen back to show one of the X Factor, and we're going back 16 years here. Really? Uh, yeah, I You're mean, it's kidding. incredible how time flies. But going back 16 years to show to season one of the X Factor, even though it was a fairly big delivery, it I had been doing the the Prices Right up to that point as well. In fact, they still right. ran alongside each other but uh, and Family Fortune. So it was a generic game showy voice that I did for The X Factor initially. Mm. Uh, and then it morphed into something bigger because the show itself became, as it became more popular, the, you know, the, the producers and ITV 
poured more money into the production and it became a very glossy, glitzy, huge kind of pantomime of a show, mm. which was bigger than it had, it had been in its initial incarnation. So I felt, uh, although nobody ever asked me to do this, I felt that the voiceover needed to reflect the change in the show. Mm. And so year after year, I just made it bigger and more ridiculous <laughs> to reflect what the show itself was doing. Mm. And that, um, you know, that that really self-important style that um, I, I adopted for it was uh, <laughs> was became its sort of hallmark signature, you right. know, uh, yeah. almost accidentally. And so the, here we are. We end up sixteen years down the line with me, you know, shouting in my booth so loudly that small trickles of blood are issuing from my eyeballs <laughs> like a Bond <laughs> villain. And uh, and literally, I have to uh, have the studio at such a cool temperature mm. down to about. 12, 13 degrees. Really? <laughs> and I have a towel in with me because um, I literally was shouting so loudly and getting very hot doing it. Mm. <laughs> so, so did you do it from home? Sure. Uh, a mixture of both. Uh, in the early days, before people were really comfortable with home studios, yeah. and then they... Um, they let me loose on it uh, in my own studio, which was which is much better, really, because you can I can take as much time as I like over it, and I used to take a lot a lot of time over it. And people used to say, "Well, why does it take you so long to record?" Uh, you know, just an opening announcement that only lasts forty seconds, mm -hmm. and I used to say, "Well." It's like building a Swiss watch. You know, you've got lots of options. I used to read it, read it so many times and mm. take the best bits from each bit yes. and stitch them together like a like a rather like a Savile Row tailor would make a suit, and then review and then leave it for a while because you you can get what's known as sort of ear fatigue where you can't really hear things properly mm. if you've been working on something for a long time. So I'd leave it for an hour or two and come back and have another listen. And uh, only when I was really happy with it, I'd send it off. Because I think the viewer imagines you to be there hanging out backstage with Anton Deck and, you know, it sounds like there was none of that. No, although I did go to the shows, uh, mm. not all of them. I went down occasionally uh, just to put my face in because I think that's important as a voice artist because, as you say, you're not seen, mm. uh, you're working remotely and you're just like a like a service provider, if you like. Yeah. So I would make a point of going down to the studio uh, uh, on a regular basis mm. to, as you say, hang out and meet people and uh, watch the show and then go for a drink afterwards with them. So it's, yeah. uh, it is important to sort of put your face around as well as of your voice. Um, is there any exciting backstage gossip that we need to know about? Far too much to deal, <laughs> to deal with here. <laughs> it would take up the whole podcast. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so. Uh, the, 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 there is nothing really that I can say, or I'm bound not to say, I should no. say, in my contract. So I can't talk to you oh, about that. That's a real shame, but, but also not surprising. <laughs> so tell me, um, what jobs are you probably not known for, but will surprise us? Well, I've done all. I've done more or less everything in this business mm. uh, except audio, an audio book. I've never read one of those, but I, I'm, no, I'm the voice of. I did a voice for. Um, I think it was. Um, might have well have been Bolton City Council, right. uh, where I was asked to be the voice of the uh, bin lorries. So oh, when yeah. you're in Bolton and you're uh, carelessly uh, jaywalking across the street, Eleanor, you may well hear me saying. Caution! Vehicle reversing. Um, is that you? <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> now, you see, this is what Tales from the Tannoy was always supposed to be about. It was supposed to be about those voices that no one knew. Uh, so, you were, know, were people say... <laughs> <laughs> People say, you know, oh yeah, you, it's all right for you. You've got you've had a charmed life. Well, I'm the voice of the bins, matey. You can't take that away from me. <laughs> Sorry, oh, I, 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 I don't suppose you've ever had that reaction before from somebody that's no, so... <laughs> that's not surprising. I um... you didn't have a change your strap line to Peter Dixon. My, He's rubbish. My, my career's rubbish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what a rubbish voiceover. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's amazing. And I think it's really interesting that we all end up doing these strange little gigs um, alongside the high profile ones as well. Oh, many of those. I mean, I'd say more of them were strange low profile gigs than high profile. Mm -hmm. I mean, I still do them and I'm still a, a working voice. I was the voice of Cine World Cinemas for years when they had a, an information line. So I would find myself calling Cine World Cinemas to find out what was on in my local multiplex. And I'd end up talking to myself. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, it's, it then, is funny when and then, and then And then having a laugh and getting very frustrated because I was asking what the films were in my local cinema and, and, I, and I couldn't understand what I was saying. So, <laughs> did you say Hemel Hempstead? 
<laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> What is the matter with you, man? I do get very angry, actually, when Siri or whoever can't understand what I say. I'm like, do you mind? I'm a professional. But uh, you've um, written some memoirs. You're very welcome to plug them. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> and, um, and, and maybe give us a taste of what you might have discussed. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a memoir. It's a professional memoir, not a uh, biography as such. It's a, it's a collection of um, anecdotes and stories and, you know, about what I've done in my life. Mm. Uh, uh, and, and it's all laid out, laid out there in, in, in all its glory. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's been a very interesting process for me because, you know, 43 years or something of, uh, of, of voicing as a professional voice actor. And you think back and all the stuff you've done. And it really is an extraordinary amount. Uh, I was horrified in, in some ways, and no wonder I feel knackered. I've done something like 120 television shows, major TV shows and series, and God knows how many radio commercials, but I tried to work it out and gave up after a while, but it's something like 25 to 30,000 radio commercials. Wow. Um, and I've appeared on all five radio networks of the BBC. You know, it's... Uh, well, that'll annoy oh. John Briggs because he's never been on Radio 3. Hasn't he? Mm, I have. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like me to read you a little bit of the first chapter? Oh, well, why not? Yes, please. It starts off like this. The first chapter is titled, What kind of a punsy bollocks world do I live in? <laughs> That's a good start. My kind of book. Here we go. <clears throat> Could you be a little more, you know, dog-like? The request was spoken with barely disguised contempt. Uh, yes, I could, I replied. If you could be a bit more like a fucking human being. I mean, Jesus, wept, how difficult can this be? I didn't actually say that, of course, but I distinctly heard myself utter the words inside my head as I nonchalantly gazed around the three-metre-square airtight padded cell in which I was currently imprisoned. Gee, this session's going nowhere fast, I thought. Steve, the sound engineer, visibly winced and looked at the floor. The producer from the agency looked on impassively, while the two creative copywriters just looked... embarrassed. Fresh out of media college and an internship at some Shoreditch boutique brand agency, she was no more than 25 years old, platinum blonde hair, blue eyes, and a Generation Z attitude to match. She was glaring at me through the quadruple glazing of the soundproof window, separating the sound booth in which I was sitting from the control room. This was the 23rd take in a voiceover session that should have finished almost 20 minutes ago and would have had she approved take three, which was the best. The talkback microphone clicked off and slammed into the slowly developing headache caused by the increasing airlessness in the room. Through the glass, I could see her mouthing like a fish out of water. Unfortunately for her, I'd learned to lip read. All those years spent in acoustically isolated voice booths had seen to that. The obscenities were pouring from her now. Steve, the sound engineer, with his back to her but facing me, rolled his eyes to the ceiling. He'd seen and heard it all before, probably many times already that week, and then he slowly dropped his chin resignedly onto his chest. She paused, mid-rant, to sip her barista-style skinny white latte flat almond mocha ristretto and give her equally complicated keto-centric lunch to the pre-pubescent studio runner who was all of 16 years old and greener behind the ears than an avocado salad, which coincidentally is just what she ordered for lunch. Although she could just as easily have been calling him a fucking idiot, it was hard to tell as her articulation wasn't that great. <laughs> That's that is brilliant. <laughs> and if you've if you've say you've never done an audio book, I think I think you've just begun one. Well, I'm going to have to do this one, aren't I? You're going I, mean, to I, couldn't have give, to. I couldn't give this to anybody else. Definitely not. <laughs> and it's wonderful actually to hear that even top professionals have sessions from hell. So oh, yes, <laughs> and that's yeah. oh, a brilliant many. way to start it. Um, <laughs> yeah, many of them. It gets worse from that point on. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least your career that was didn't. A good bit. <laughs> <laughs> You've been listening to Tales from the Tannoy with Eleanor Hamilton and Peter Dixon with music from Beats Bakery. This podcast was produced by Carl Svensson of Tadar Media. <laughs> <laughs>